They've been faithful members, now they feel like prodigal sons. Some Cleveland Catholics who've lost their churches are fighting back. Too often job training leads to more heartbreak, and the Cleveland torso murders still mystify 75 years later. We'll sit down tonight with Jan Juhas, a St. Ember's parishioner who went out and hired legal help, lawyer Santiago Feliciano. Then we'll talk with Brad Whitehead, president of the Fund for Our Economic Future, and local writer James Bedall. You're tuned to Fegler and Friends. Thousands of Cleveland Catholics have had to endure the closing of churches where, for generations, they baptized their young, married off their sons and daughters, and mourned their dead. Like many private companies, their diocese is downsizing. For most, disappointment gave way to resignation, and the sheep moved, moved quietly to pastures farther afield, but some are fighting back, including parishioners at St. Emmerich, who still hope to change the bishop's mind. And thanks a lot for coming tonight. You know, I, we've had uh, Mr. Closon from uh, St. Peter, and this is a similar, very similar story. And it puzzles and confounds me because when this thing first started, I, a non-Catholic, didn't pay much attention. I thought it was about the fact that since people were moving out to the suburbs, the parishes in town couldn't support themselves. Now I'm finding out that's not true at all. Could have well, supported yourself, did support yourself. Yes, exactly. That's, that's one of the great, uh, let's say, pieces of misinformation that have been propagated for the last several years, that the little inner city churches can't seem to sustain themselves, that they're broke, they're poor, their roofs are falling in. Absolutely not the truth. And that is exactly why this closing, we feel is an atrocity in our case and many others that are like us mm -hmm. who have had for 106 years this house of worship, this is our spiritual home, that we've been kicked out of. And we feel that uh, this bishop has made a terribly tragic and an unjust decision. And to compound that, I'll just add that uh, our faithful priest, who for 25 years have, has given us his best services, he's been a priest for 35 years, has also been kicked to the curb, if I can use that expression, without any consideration of income. He has lost his income, which he derived from our parish. He's not a diocesan priest, so he's been dismissed. And so he's no, looking for work. He's looking for work, and they seem to find no room for him to the diocese mm -hmm. after having talked about the great problem of priest shortages. Now, yeah. what, a, what an irony that is. Well, talking about money, there is your, I know you're about to say this, probably, but there is some method to his madness here, right? Well, well absolutely. And, and the, the misnomer, as John has said, is that all of these parishes, these, these, these city parishes, and most of them ethnic, um, it appears, or it's been, it's made, it's been made to appear that somehow all of them collectively were having terrible financial problems. And the truth of that is so far from that. Uh, St. Emmerich had about three quarters of a million dollars. I think St. Casimir had over a million. St. Wendelin's had over a million. We're talking substance of dollars here. And, and, and many of them actually, uh, similar to St. Emmerich, had a priest from their own country. Right. So the, the, there wasn't a drain either financially, nor was it a drain on personnel. Right. These, these parishes sustain themselves. The other thing is they, they have what's called assessments, which is the power to tax by the church. All of these parishes were current in their assessments. So they tithe as they should to the diocese. They maintained their buildings. Their buildings were in wonderful shape. They were used for all kinds of different things, from scouts to other kinds of activity. No. They were not underutilized. But for whatever reason, they didn't hit that magic number that I don't know how you figure that out. But I'm hearing now, I think the diocese themselves said, 20, I don't know if it was 2,500 people or 2,500 families. We've heard uh, that. that in, just, in that's astronomical. Is the heritage of St. Mark, is that Hungarian? <coughs> yes, it's a Hungarian. I thought so. And didn't you have at one time, maybe you sold a, a Boy Scout troop that was... The Boy Scouts were very well. Spoke Hungarian? Yes, and absolutely. Hungarian? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. They, still, they still continue to work. And, uh, now, you haven't got a place to live now. St. Peter's went out and bought an old Baker Electric uh, factory, I, I guess, over yes. at uh, you could have it, uh, and they moved in there to the... Uh, fury of the bishop. I was privileged to witness their first Sunday Mass. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that has come to, to uh, light lately is the bishop is not exactly uh, charitable in his tones when he writes to you guys about this <laughs> stuff. He's threatened you with excommunication possibly, right? And uh, he's, he's warned you that you will not go to heaven. Well, if loss you take of this salvation ex. is uh, loss one step salvation. beyond excommunication. <laughs> uh, oh yeah, that's, that's even worse, right? Yes, right? So you won't go to heaven for do, if you do this. And uh, you're, you're gonna, there's no hope for you. You just, you just, that's, that's what uh, pretty harsh language. That's pretty harsh. And I want to go back to, to, to your priest again because uh, did they, 
there was something I read someplace that they, they were charging him with some kind of misconduct someplace. What was that about? Let me, let me, uh, let me summarize as follows. The statement, and I had a, I had a meeting with the bishop uh, three weeks ago that was more or less a, an opportunity to force a situation to come together so we could hear our, he could hear our grievances. And what he explained to me, which was unbelievable, incredible, at that meeting was that he wondered a new canonical rule since 2002, things that happened in Boston around wow. that time. He says that because he's not a diocesan priest and he couldn't vouch for him, he needed a certification letter from his bishop in Transylvania, his, his home origin, that certified that he was not involved in any kind of pedophilia. Mm. Now, the man left Transylvania 35 yeah, years ago. He's been over, here, he's been over here for 25 years. Yeah. If anyone should know what his status is, it should be the bishops here. And the man has been given us a stellar uh, level of service for 25 years. He's been our revered priest for that time. May, may I just interject here? Because sure. uh, I worked for the diocese, as some may or may not know, for any number of years. And actually, that was something that the United States Catholic Conference put into effect in the 90s. It, it may have been uh, formalized, if you I don't know how it could have been any more formal that you had to do that. So it would have been from, from, from the 90s on that when you sent someone from one diocese to the other, what you were vouching for is that there was no problem. And, and I find it particularly curious for this bishop because um, he has sent a letter to, the, uh, to California, I believe to the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, vouching for Father Shanley, who is one of the most prolific child abusers in the history of the Catholic Church in the United States. Yeah. I have a copy of the letter, actually. He sends it out, and then he has the audacity to turn around and say, well, this priest who has been in this diocese for 25 years, I worked for the diocese for 22 years, and work with these kinds of issues, never in my 22 years did I hear the remotest comment about fathers. So I find it particularly interesting when someone has, if you will, sinned by sending someone right. someplace else and then says, well, I don't know if this guy's clean or not. If we're, if, we're, if we're too tough on the bishop up here, of course, he's welcome to come back on equal time. He said with the insurances that will not happen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but I, I want to get to the lawyer aspect of this thing. Now, you've sure. got a lawyer. What are you going to do? Well, legally, legal, legally um, each parish, each individual parish is, is a trust. It's an implied trust in the state of Ohio. Um, the, the canon law, is a, as a matter of fact, let me just digress for a minute. Um, you know, his statement uh, implying excommunication, it's a lot more difficult than, than, you know, there are all kinds of canonical mm -hmm. protections and norms for if he chooses to try to do that against Father uh, uh, Maroney, who's a great priest, against the parishioners, that aside. Now, it, canonically, the, the Church of Rome does not want all parishes held as, as, as one entity, which is corporations sold in a different part of the, of the United States. They use it mostly in the Southwest because it's more of a Spanish law phenomenon here. They are individual trusts. And both canonically and civilly, since they are viewed as trusts, the church would call them moral juridic persons. Before you suppress them, you're supposed to engage the parishioners. There's mm -hmm. a whole process. And this was done by fiat. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and under the trust, the, the, these people's ancestors, John's ancestors, were the grantors because they're the ones who bought the land mm -hmm. and set it all up. They become the beneficiaries and they've continued to maintain it. My belief is that we have to follow Ohio law and trust law and you need to do the proscripts both canonically and civilly yeah. before you make this decision but, to uh, close and to suppress. That's what I wanted to ask you because I know that canon law is involved and people have already gone to Rome and pled, pled their case and sure. been pretty much rejected, <clears throat> I think, up till now. We still have appeals. They, they still, yeah, there's right still now. appeals. But there is also a, a civil action you can take here, which has nothing to do with canon law. Correct. And that's the thing I haven't heard much about until you just mentioned it. So you, you can proceed on that basis Okay, also. and, and the, um, it is, was this, the Ohio Supreme Court in the 1890s in a famous case called Mannix v. Purcell that said that each parish is a trust, is an implied trust. Mm -hmm. The bishop is merely the administrator. He didn't own the property. The property is owned in the name of the Roman Rite Church and the beneficiaries are the, are the parishioners. We are saying that as those beneficiaries, if you are going to close, do away with, abolish a trust, you must follow the proscripts of the law of the state of Ohio. And so, we are saying so they if, did not if do that. If you win civilly somehow, 
but don't win in a row. Where does that leave you? Well, or do you know? <laughs> well, you know what? I don't know uh -huh. because, um, again, uh, there is a, a, a pattern that, uh, the, again, there are proscripts canonically that should have been followed and they were not. The court has said when it comes to money and those sorts of issues, they have jurisdiction. They clearly do. And the, uh, the, uh, the, the canon law always speaks about whatever country the Roman Catholic Church is in, it must follow the proscripts and the laws of that country. Mm -hmm. So to be very honest, Dick, I don't know. Civil It'll put us in a, in a conundrum there at, the, at some point. Can I ask you one of those television questions I don't normally ask people? How outraged are the people in your parish about what's going on here? Have, are you losing them? We have lost a significant number. Right now, the, the aftermath of this closing is still kind of fresh. And a lot of people are struggling, Sundays especially, yeah. but in general, where to go, where do we, where do we attach ourselves, reattach ourselves? And it, it's especially for an ethnic parish that has right. been used to having a practice of worship in their native tradition, native mm -hmm. language, this is really hard. Now, we've been told by the bishop that, you know, we should go across town or St. Elizabeth's is still alive and well. We suspect that um, that's also a short-term solution mm -hmm. because St. Elizabeth's has a priest who will likely retire soon. That's the last Hungarian priest. There will not be Hungarian yeah. mass probably after next year sometime. So that's not a So not right a now you're meeting season. on the sidewalk? We're praying on the sidewalk every yeah. Sunday. May, may I just add, because sure. I, I represent uh, a, a group of parishioners. I don't represent the whole parish, all the parishioners. But in speaking to some of the people who are my clients, it, what is absolutely tragic is, is speaking to people who came here in 1956. Mm -hmm. who oh, during stood, the revolution? During the revolution. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they stood right. in the streets and, and <laughs> shot at tanks with handguns and Molotov cocktails, watched their countrymen, including children, being murdered, and listening to them say, we never thought we would, would come to the again, United yeah. States and freedom. then lose our church. They, and I've been told by so many Hungarians, even the Marxist government did not, did not dare pass. to close That's a Roman right. Catholic became, church, I think and it's done here. The largest here. Hungarian city has had a boot of That is exactly right. right. That yeah. is still, still true. But it yeah. is heartbreaking. Well, we're going to continue to follow this. It really is. I mean, from our standpoint, it's a very good story. From your standpoint, it's more than that. But well, we hope you come back and see us as this thing goes along. Yes. And uh, give, give us fill-ins on how it's going. My thanks to John Yuhas and Santiago, Charlie, Feliciano, for being here tonight. Stay tuned. There's more just ahead. I just stay there for you. A recession might be loosening its grip on the nation, but it's still a daily kick in the gut to many in Northeast Ohio who wake up every morning hoping to get the phone call that will lead to a new job. For some, have tried to sweeten their resume with job training, only to run into another dead end. The Fund for Our Economic Future has heard that complaint and hopes to turn a multi-million dollar shot of grant money into better outcomes for the jobless. Uh, first of all, Tell us what this is exactly, your organization. Uh, so the Fund for Economic Future is a collaboration of the philanthropic community in Northeast Ohio who is working on the long-term health, economic health of our region. And most of what we've done uh, in the past six years has been on creating new jobs, building new industries and the like. Uh, but this grant is focused really on the preparation of workers uh, for the jobs that uh, will be created. I want to get back to that in a minute, but I want to ask you this, because I'm very naive when it comes to stimulus money and right. job creation and all that stuff. I certainly had, probably because of my geriatric age, uh, the impression when this depression hit, I will call it a depression, uh, that it was going to look like Roosevelt all over again, and we'll have people out there swinging picks and, and digging right. up right. infrastructure right. and fixing pipes and stuff like that, you know, real tangible stuff, WPA all over again. Right. They didn't go that route. Uh, should they have gone that route? Well, uh, I will say we at the fund are focused on the long-term mm -hmm. job creation and yeah. so forth as opposed to the short-term stimulus. And there has been some of that. So if you saw this week or this past week the announcement that there is, uh, what is it, $100 million coming into Ohio to do the 21st century equivalent of those road building mm -hmm. projects, which is laying fiber for computers and infrastructure and so forth. And um, and so, and there's a lot of money coming down the road for, or has been coming down the road for construction as well. So there's probably more of that than we may think. Fewer dams, but uh, yeah, well, lots of orange barrels. Very, and I guess the orange well, barrels are our barrels. Always yeah, with yeah, us, yeah. though. Good times are ill, That's you know. True. But the uh, dams is, is is funny thing to mention because you know all those projects back in the 30s are so big and visible. Yes. I mean, you, we still got some around Huntington Beach and Bay Village. There were a tunnel under the road that was built 
Absolutely. WPA. Yeah. So you drive around and point to those, and they were more easy to see, and you could see lines of guys who didn't have to get retrained as right. long as they could use a pick right. out there doing it. Times have changed an awful lot, I know, but I'm interested in how this works. Well, they've changed hugely, and uh, you know, the, if we think about where the growth and the jobs in the future are coming, it isn't enough anymore to have elbow grease, uh, even if you're in manufacturing, which is going to be an area yeah, of growth here you've got to have a set of skills that are beyond what you may have gotten in high school. And so while there are issues and questions with training programs and such, it's still two thirds of the job, mm -hmm. two thirds of the jobs being re uh, created still require some sort of training beyond the high school level. That's gonna raise those issues yeah. uh, based on the story in the Times, as I'm sure you read, yeah. that gave uh, kind of a mixed grade to these. Yeah. And it, some of it was anecdotal information some of some studies they did, right. but it was all over the lot. I mean, you didn't know which, which side to believe. So right. some of the story in the Times said they had found it really, there wasn't that much difference whether you went to training or didn't go to training, and that this was true even before the recession hit us. Yes. Uh, another study said, oh, no, you know, you can get this much more money. How do you know who to believe anymore in these things? Well, I mean, that's the spirit of this grant program that we're unfolding uh, in, in the coming, is, in, in the coming uh, weeks here is, is to really focus in and identify those programs that are working. And so the spirit of what we're trying to do is to recognize there are many good things happening at the local level. We need to lift those up. We need to get those that are innovating connecting with each other. And then the real thing that we see is that the best job training programs are the ones that have direct links to employers. Mm -hmm. So the idea of training people and then pushing them out onto the market and hopefully uh, there's a job for them is less effective than a job training program where you're connected to employer right from the get-go. That's what the Times also pointed yeah. out, that some guy had gone out having been trained for something and gone to answer an, an ad and, and found that the room was full. Yeah. You know, 200 people had yeah. beaten there. Well, I think one thing we need to recognize that in, in the short term, we'll talk about the long term in a minute, but in the short term, a training program doesn't create a job. But what a training program does is that if you're a person who needs a job, it mm -hmm. puts you in a better position to be able to get hold and advance in a job. It's a lot like really healthcare in a sense that if you eat right and exercise, you know. there's no guarantee you're going to live longer, but the probability is greater mm -hmm. that you will. And again, if we come back to this idea, too, that two-thirds of the jobs created require some sort of training beyond high school, um, look, there's no guarantee, but if you want to work, uh, you better get some training. Does all this tremendous amount of outsourcing bother you or make you mad? It does both to me. <laughs> How about you? Well, what we're seeing is... Um, a lot more insourcing going on now. Jobs are coming back uh, from overseas. There's a company in, in Youngstown, uh, Revere Data, it's mm -hmm. called. They located here, by the way, from San Francisco because San Francisco was too expensive for them, but they didn't go to India or China. Right. And what they found is that it was too much of a hassle to be working overseas, and so they're bringing, well, they started with 40 jobs, they're adding another 100 jobs in downtown Youngstown. So. Yeah, I guess outsourcing is, uh, is, is bothersome, but I like our odds, and we're seeing a lot of the jobs uh, potentially coming back. What do you, what do you, how do you view this long term? This is where you get to guess. I yeah. think everybody does. Yeah, right. And I've heard, I heard it said just this morning on NPR that they thought that, that we might be back down to 5% unemployment by the end of uh, 14. Now, I don't know if that's too soon or not. I mean, yeah. Well... I don't know. Yeah. I don't think any of us know. I, I think we're seeing promising signs. And I think one thing that viewers here in Northeast Ohio can take heart of is that a 9.5 or 9.3 percent unemployment rate really stinks. It's bad. Yeah. But what's different is that what we're experiencing now is a global recession. And so for the last year, believe it or not, the unemployment rate has been lower here in Greater mm -hmm. Cleveland than it has been in the nation. And that's very different than the situation we were in five or six years ago when the national economy was growing and our unemployment rate was considerably right. higher. Yeah. And so whether the national economy comes back fast or slow uh, is, uh, is anybody's guess, but I think the heart we can take in, in what we're seeing is that this time it looks like we may come back with it and on a relative basis we're doing okay. Well, you know, I heard a little factoid, which I found amusing, you might too, that during, in, in, after the crash of 1929, the stock market crash, they didn't know what to call the situation we were in. They used to use the word panic right. past that point. 
So they decided to call it a depression because they thought the word recession sounded bad. They thought a depression <laughs> right, just yeah. sounds like a little goes down dip a little. in the road. Yeah, but yeah. when you're refeeding, it's like my hairline. That's right. worse. So that's how it, this is only a recession and not a depression. I, mean, I think it's both. Well, listen, good luck. Thanks a lot. We need yeah. this kind of thing going on, and I'm glad you're here. Thanks to Brad Whitehood of the Fund for Our Economic Future. Stay tuned. There's more coming up right ahead. If you've been around Cleveland for a while, as I have, you've heard about the infamous Torso Murders, the mad butcher of Kingsbury Run, as the killer came to be known, dispatched and dismembered at least a dozen victims in the 1930s and completely eluded capture. So it's thought one man was arrested and linked to a single torso murder, but he didn't live long enough to come to trial. And it's there that Cleveland writer Jim Badal's latest book picks up. Though Murder Has No Tongue is the title. And it explores the mystery of a vagrant named Frank Dolezal. Is that the way he pronounces his Dolezal. name? Dolezal. 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 Frank Dolezal is the guy they, they arrested. The sheriff's deputies, I guess, was yes. arrested. Uh, and threw in the clink, thinking he had done this. But I don't want to tell it. You tell it. First of all, tell us about what they, these murders really were about, what they were like. Well, that's a good question. What were they about? <laughs> uh, there was a string of a dozen decapitation murders in the 1930s running roughly from September of 1935 to August of 1938. Uh, The butcher, as he was known, sometimes dismembered his victims more than simply removing their heads. Both men and women, black and white, I sometimes joke and say an equal opportunity serial killer, which Mm -hmm. is really quite rare. And this went on over a span of how many years? About five. About five years. Mm -hmm. And in the the middle of those years, when we were getting some national publicity for this stuff, uh, you write in your book that we had the uh, Republican convention coming up and the Great Lakes Exposition coming up, and everybody wanted this to go away. They could make it go away. And it didn't. (laughs) It just kept right Summer of 1936, there were three bodies that turned up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I remember uh, hearing this guy called the headhunter of Kingsbury Run. I remember whether this is true or not that the butcher came from the fact that he wrapped a lot of these bodies up like in, like in but- butcher paper or something like that? He did that once or twice. Mm-hmm. And it may have been a grim joke, you know, who knows. Uh, he wrapped some of the body parts in newspapers and packed them into burlap bags. Yeah. Uh, there was really <coughs> a very twisted sense of humor going on here. Tell people if they don't know. I mean, the Kingsbury Run I'm aware of is over near, not too far from Shaker Square. You used to pass it when you went down the hill getting you know, toward the lake. But where is Kingsbury Run as far as you're aware? Kingsbury Run is attached to the flats. It's mm-hmm. actually a prehistoric riverbed. And it swings in a southeast arc out to about Shaker mm-hmm, Square, mm-hmm. bordered on the north pretty much by Woodland yeah. and on the south pretty much by the Broadway uh, East 55th mm-hmm. area. So near, near the rapid? Yes. Okay. And it wasn't exactly any beautiful flowing river Afton ever was. Actually, it used to be. Oh, is that right? Uh, in the 19th century, yes. It was something like a public park. Mm. Uh, it had seen better days v- before the killer started making it his stomping ground. Mm. Now, when, you, when, they, when the cops in the sheriff's department found out to look for this guy, uh, were they working against each other or in tandem? No, they were working against each other. Mm. Uh, the sheriff's office was Democratic. The city administration was Republican. Elliot Ness was nominally a Republican. And so there was a great deal of one-upmanship to be gained by catching the Kingsbury Run murderer when the Cleveland police couldn't. So finally they pick up this guy, Dolezal, who, uh, as you describe him, is kind of a, he's an alcoholic. He's kind of a wimpy guy with mood swings. Nobody yeah. really thinks he's capable of this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And he's living in kind of a crummy area, not too far from the mm-hmm. courthouse and the police station, I guess. And yeah. I'm paying with And uh, how, how did they happen to finger him for this? It's a very long, complicated story. Uh, he had been fingered by the Cleveland police already. In fact, the lead detective on the case, Peter Merlo, had dragged him in twice for interrogation, but then ultimately decided that this was not the perpetrator. So when the sheriff's men began zeroing in on him, there was precedent in the sense that he had been looked at before. Mm -hmm. And as I said in the book, he's not an angel, or was not an angel. Well, did he admit, he admitted to one of the murders, didn't he, before he died? Uh, He admitted to this meeting, he admitted to murdering Flo Palillo, not Mm -hmm. once, but three times. And the confessions were all 
as we know now, beaten out of him. Mm -hmm. They all fell apart because, as Merlot points out in his memoirs, the man simply did not know the details of the crime to which he was confessing. So they put him in jail and he stays there. Did they, have they charged him yet with anything? How long no. did he stay there before? The, did they ever charge him with anything? He was in jail about a week before he was charged. In fact, this brought the American Civil, Deliber Civil Liberties Union in on the case. And they took him before a judge without having an attorney present. And so even by the standards of the day, his rights were very seriously and repeatedly violated. As I remember, as you say in the book, if I'm right, they broke into his little apartment without a warrant. They searched the place, ran the oh, yeah. had, had no warrant, nope. dragged him off to jail, mm -hmm. didn't charge him for a week, mm -hmm. and allegedly just abused him to the point that he said what they, what, what they wanted to hear. Whatever they wanted to hear. Even though, well, how, tell me about the circumstances of his demise. This is the great mystery. And I should point out, this is something that your book talks about in detail that no other book written on this subject does, right? Uh, no other book has been written about Frank Dolezal. Okay. He supposedly hanged himself in his cell with a noose that he made from rags which the sheriff deputies had given him because he wanted something to do. So they said, here, clean your cell. <laughs> he was on suicide watch because he had made two suicide attempts. And he supposedly only hung for a few minutes, long enough to asphyxiate. But the morgue photographs show a very deep, very narrow mark on his neck. And I have testimony in the book from forensic anthropologists and medical examiners who say that cloth noose could not possibly have made that mark. You think he was murdered? I th yes. Okay. We've got to say rather rapidly here, and I'm going to repeat it too, I think, that you've got a book signing coming up. Oh, it's going to be a grand affair, I hope. And it, where is it going it to be? Will be at and when is it going to be? It'll be Sunday, this Sunday at Lago Restaurant in Tremont uh, from 3 to 6. I will be there. Okay. One of Frank Dolezal's relatives will be there, a good friend Sounds of mine, good. Mary, and she will help. Okay. She'll sign the book too. Great. Good luck with it. Okay? Thank you. The title of the book again is Though Murder Has No Tongue, from Kent State University Press, I want to thank author Jim Badal for being here tonight. He'll be signing copies of the book, as we said, from 3 to 6 Sunday afternoon at the Lago Restaurant and Wine Bar in Tremont. Thank you for tuning in. See you again next week.